It's really a joy to be able to welcome everybody out to week two of Brainstorm. At the heart of this, we understand change your thinking, change your living. Now, one of the things that's going to be true for every one of us in here, since we all have a brain, is that our thoughts are moving in a direction. And what I want us to do is I want to start out today by taking a quick mind thought assessment. Not an IQ test, so no worries right there, right? But um, where are your thoughts moving right now? What direction are your thoughts being pulled in? If you've got your handout, you can make an arrow that's on the handout itself. Otherwise, you can look up to the screen and do this um, in your mind. It's one of the amazing things that your mind is able to do. Anxiety or peace? Which direction do your thoughts, as of late, which direction are they moving? What direction are they pulling you? Here or here? How about the matter of worry or peacefulness? Hope. Would you put your arrow toward my thoughts moving in a negative direction or my thoughts moving in a positive direction? And lastly, would your arrow go my thoughts are more self-centered, my thoughts are more God-centered? And I want to ask, anybody have any arrows that are pointing at all on this side of the chart in this direction at all anybody like that kind of see your hands because my hand is definitely raised with regards to this i got some that are moving over here i got to pay attention to that because my mind my body physiologically psychologically i operate way better if they're pointing and moving in this direction over here stress Negative impacts can all take place. But the fact that they're moving means that they're taking me somewhere. Our series Maxim says this, that our life is moving in the direction of our strongest thoughts. It's moving in the direction of our thinking. Would you just say that with me, everybody, starting here? Our life is moving in the direction of our strongest thoughts. I want to do it one more time, but I'd like you to personalize it if you would. So rather than just the general truth, our lives, to put my life in there. Same down here. Ready? My life is moving in the direction of my strongest thoughts. Whatever way those arrows are moving, that's the direction your life is moving as well. Because God tells us this. He says, be careful how you think. Your life is being shaped moved by your thoughts. This is a verse over these next three weeks now that's left in our series. I'd really encourage you to memorize it. Just, you know, once a day, say that out loud because this is a truth that is going to impact you for the rest of your life. It's rather a simple thought. And then it's kind of a profound thought all put together. This understanding that I cannot have a positive life if I have a negative mind. Ever thought about that? Now, I don't know if you know anybody that would have, would have said this or said it out loud. Well, I just can't help myself. I just can't help the fact that I have, a, I have negative thoughts or I can't have a, of a negative mind. Anybody know somebody that's ever said that? You know, somebody like that. I get a friend, right, that would say that. No, here's the truth. There is a lot. There is most of life that we can't control circumstances and everything, you know, things of great importance. And this just drives control freaks crazy. They're like, just watch me. Right? I mean, like, I'm going to try and do that. But the fact of the matter is, there is so much of life and people that you can't control. But God wants us to know this, that you can control your mind. You can't control what happens out there. You can control your response to it. And this is another case in which God and science literally walk step in step with each other. Neuroscience reinforces the fact that you get to control your minds as well as God telling us that. In fact, telling us to continually to renew our minds. So let's... Let's take an example today and begin to develop and build it to be able to help us and to have something to be able to take out, to be able to share with others and our friends as well. Because, you know, as we, the more we share with this, we can invite them back to join us here for next week as well. 
I'm going to ask you, we're going to look at a Bible, you know, Bible store here, so I want you to grab a Bible today. If you got one, if you got yours, grab it. If you got one on your phone, pull it up. If you don't, grab a pew Bible. Turn over, we're going to look at Philippians chapter 1, and a couple of verses in particular, verses 12 through 14. Now we're actually going to be stepping into a story here. One of the things about stepping in the middle of a conversation, a lot of times it's like, what are we talking about? I don't get it. You don't have that, you know, like, what's going on right here? So let me tell you the, the story that you're going to be stepping into. It involves an individual. His name is Paul. Paul was a contemporary of Jesus, lived at the same time. He was familiar with his ministry, the things that he did. Paul was also a very religious man. Paul, though, as a young man, determined that he was not going to be a follower of Jesus, In fact, so much so, Paul actually became what you'd call, he was the tip of the spear when it came to the persecution of the church. Paul was personally responsible for the murdering of so many Christian men and women. There were scores and scores of people. He made their lives miserable, driving them out of their homes, whippings, beatings, imprisonments that were going on. This was Paul's life until something shocking took place. Paul's friends were shocked. Paul himself would have been shocked. Even Christian people, when they heard about it, they're like, they're shocked. They wouldn't believe it. But Paul, the tip of the spear for persecuting the church, actually becomes a Christian. He becomes a follower of Jesus. And not just simply a follower of Jesus, but he joins Jesus in the mission that he started. And Paul, for 30 years of his life then, goes and he helps to spread the gospel literally all throughout the known world. So that's where we're going to be picking it up right now. Later in Paul's life, and Paul now has been imprisoned. In fact, he's been in prison for some years right now. He's literally in chains. Hadn't done anything wrong. You talk about just like you know, difficult, miserable life. But in those circumstances, Paul now is writing a letter. That's what we're looking at, his letter that he's writing here. He's writing it to other Christians in other churches, to people that were facing difficult circumstances in their lives. I mean, things that would go like, you got a good reason to have, you know, depression or anxiety in your life, you know, worry or fear because of these real things that you guys are, you know, facing and dealing with persecutions that are going on. So Paul here is going to just kind of open up his heart to them. Now, let me read from you from the NMT. You might want to look at the screen for this. Paul says, You think your life sucks? You think you got problems? I follow Jesus, and this is where it's gotten me. I'm done giving. I got bills, and there's stuff that I want. Quitting my small group, not going to go to church either. I have discovered that there's some hypocrites out there. And you know what? It's just not meeting my needs. Where's God when I need him? Now you may have realized there isn't actually an NMT. The NMT would be this. It's the negative mind translation. (laughs) Easy to get there, right? You could go there. Circumstances support it. But in those very same difficult circumstances, years in prison right now in chains, Paul's going to write these words. In fact, you can look at this latter part of verse 18. If your Bible's open, you can see these words. He says, actually, yes. And I continue, say it with me, to to rejoice. Like, what is up with this? Look at verse 12. He said, now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, all these people out there is writing too, that what has actually happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it's become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I'm in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord And dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. Now, Paul's going to go on, if you would flip back a little bit in Philippians. We'll get to this in a couple of um, weeks, actually. But he's going to go on to write this. He said, now, I have learned, 
And I'm so glad that Paul is honest here. He just kind of like opens up. He said, I have learned to be content. I've learned that whatever my circumstances that I'm not in control of, in any, in every situation, I've learned, operative word, didn't come natural for me. It wasn't where my mind took me. But this discovery has changed everything. Now, what's the learning that Paul's talking about? What's the discovery Paul's talking about? It's going to bring us to this. Paul said, I have learned how valuable and important it is to frame and to reframe in my life. I've learned how important it is. When I come to this brainstorm that's in my mind, this is, a, you know, I, this is just an MRI of my brain, by the way. All the stuff that's going on in there, but it's an MRI of yours as well, this imaging in there, that I have learned If you interpret God in light of your circumstances, this is the picture that you get. But when you will interpret your circumstances in light of God, it is a very different picture. So let's continue to develop our example. Paul had a dream. He had a lifelong goal. This is like, here's my aspiration. My dream is to be able to go to Rome, which was the capital of the known world there, and to be able to share the gospel of Jesus. That was Paul's dream. And one day he makes it there. But when Paul makes it to Rome, he's there literally in chains. He is chained 24 hours a day to two different men, two of the palace guards that are going on there. And he is chained day after day, now week after week, then month after month, hear me, and now it's been year after year with no hope at all of ever getting out of the situation that he's in. Paul goes, this this is my life. This is where I'm at. This is how my dream, this is how my dream works out. Every eight hours. These people that he's chained to because he's such a high value prisoner, they rotate in and they rotate out. But as I said, there is no privacy at any time ever for Paul. He can have some people come in, he can do his thing, but he is never without these people that are chained to him. My life, you can fill in the word however you want right there. But Paul saw things a little differently. Paul began looking at these people that he was chained to and said, these men, as well as their families, they really need Jesus. And in fact, These are elite, so these are special forces that they would be in the Roman Empire. They were Nero's guard himself. These were people that would never, ever, ever have gone to church. One, just because of, you know, the duties and demands of their life, but two, because they're Nero's guards. Nero is the one that was worshipped in Rome. So you don't go to church to worship someone other than Nero that way. It would have been considered treasonous that way. These people would never have gone there. But Paul, as he just shares and he shows them, here's what God's doing, and they've seen some of the miracles that Paul does in other people's lives. The next thing you know is one after another, after another, after another, they just begin opening their heart up because their heart has been longing for something all of their lives. They've had this God-shaped hole, and it is being filled with the only thing that can fill it, which is Jesus himself. Their families are being transformed as the result of it. This pagan, dark, palace that's there the empire seat all of a sudden is becoming a beacon for light paul in verses 12 through 14 has taken what could have been framed this way and he has framed things in a very different way and do you think that has changed him this matter of reframing it's not just for looking back 
But this is a day-to-day thing. This is a dynamic that I want us to understand this weekend. That is the power to bring change to us and the change that we long for to get us out of this and into a different place that we can be. So listen to Daryl's story. I want you just to think about that. 15 years ago, life was good. I had a house, two little kids, two beautiful daughters. My oldest was three and a half at the time. Um, Unfortunately, my wife was diagnosed with breast cancer. After her diagnosis, she went through long chemotherapy and radiation. So it was about a solid year of treatments and and challenge. Um, Fortunately, she went into remission. So we thought she had a recurrence, um, and it was pretty bad. I remember being out in the driveway at my house and kind of pacing around. It was a quiet day, and started to think. You know, she and I both knew that she was likely going to die here. But then I started to think about my kids, young girls, and this house, and my career, and uh, the, the real bills on the table. So it, it starts to starts to pile up. So here I am sitting on the curb <laughs> on the side of the road. And along comes a good friend of mine. Asked me how's it, you know, what I'm up to, what's going on? <laughs> so I tell him, you know, here's all the things that are going on. I'm going nuts here, you know, whining and complaining and telling him that I, I don't see a path forward. And he, and he hits me with questions. Do you believe in God? And yes, I, you know, yeah, I, I, I believe in God, of course. He said, no, do you, do you really believe, do you have faith that Jesus Christ will save you? Because if you did, I, I don't think you'd be sitting here whining, complaining that, you know, there would be no future for you and that there's no joy. You didn't fail, the house is still here, nothing collapsed. Kids are still running around happy. You have to trust that the Lord will carry you every day here. And you're not going to know what it looks like, and you're going to have to keep walking into it, and you're going you're to need to do it. You know, it wasn't like, wow, the clouds opened and everything was flowers and roses. But literally that afternoon, I, I just, I, I was walking through my yard and my little, my, my daughter, my oldest one, was running around the house. And she came around the corner and just laughing like crazy. I don't know if she was running from the dog or <laughs> what she was doing. And I mean, I just, I saw it. I'm like, oh my gosh, I, I'm over there on the curb, crying and miserable. And here she is happy as can be. I've got, I've got a real situation here that I need to concern myself with. I've got to keep myself together and focus on my kids and my career and this home and keeping the future moving. I think whatever causes breast cancer, it, it, it happens. But I think Satan's very attracted to it. He loves it. He gets into the people's heads and the situation and he creates anger and frustration and fighting and right, fear. And he makes you question God. He really makes you wonder. God is not about fear. He never was. He doesn't deliver fear. He delivers hope and strength and, 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 and provision. My wife passed away about a month and a half after that. Um, and those days were hard. I mean, every, every day from that day was still hard. Um, but they were different, you know? They were just different. Pro Health published this nice book. It's called The Book of Hope. And the lead story is the story of my wife. Ten years later, I, I get another book. This book says Merry Christmas. It's my, my two daughters, older, right? And my wife and my stepson. They, 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 in secret, they went and got these pictures taken and they put together this book and cards and they gave it to me for Christmas as a gift. Just the gift itself was <laughs> amazing. But imagine, and I, because I do imagine, me sitting on the curb that day and my friend giving me this book and saying, here, here you go. 10 years from now, now what do you see? No one will ever convince me that God does not exist. 
they will never convince me of that. They will never convince me that Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit doesn't work in our lives every day. The hardest days. I, I, I've seen it. I've lived it. He's real. And, he, and he, he works miracles. Big ones. Now, Daryl's here with us in the service. So can we just say to Daryl, hey, you know, thank you for opening up and sharing that. Powerful, right? So how do we, how do we do this framing, this reframing that we need in our lives? I hope you find these things to be really, really practical and things that you can do even, you know, starting this week. One of the first ones um, takes us back to um, relationships in our life. So, I mean, you've heard of a BFF, right? And we got a BFF out there? Yeah, I've never met a guy, so I got BFFs. Like, right? Like, yeah, well, come on. But rather than a BFF, if you're going to do framing in your life, you are going to need some FBFs in your life. And by that I mean, you're going to need some faith-building friends. With Daryl, he'd have told you. He was here, and he could not get out of here by himself. But his friend came along and helped him to do a very significant reframing that he really, really needed in his life. You hear us talk about, with regularity around here, the importance of being in a group. And sometimes you may hear, oh, they're just trying to get me into a class, right? I mean, good classes, right? You know, a good financial peace class, or maybe it's, um, you know, advanced biblical study. I mean, good classes, but I'm busy in my life, and I just don't need another, I don't feel like I need another class. And we'd agree. Probably don't need another class. But what you do need, what we all need, is faith-building friends, and if I'd ask you today, do you have faith-building friends in your life? And you go like, well, I got friends, but I really don't have any faith-building friends. Then you're never going to be able to get this reframing when you need it done. If you think about it, just being in a group, it's an environment where this can take place. You may be just kind of like... I'm not even sure about Christianity. I'm not sure about God. I just got so many questions. You get into starting point. Starting point is the group, but you're there with other people that are asking those same questions, and it's a safe environment to be able to do that. That's why we find over and over in starting point that these faith-building friendships make all the difference to help me to get where I need to go. Maybe you're a Christian, been a Christian for a while, and you go like, I'd like, to, I'd like to really understand what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. Rooted is a great group for you to be able to do that in. For some, again, I just want to know more about the Bible. I want to do some advanced biblical study things. We've got brand new classes, new teachers that are doing that. It helps us, right? It helps us to know what some things that God says, but more importantly, it gives us an environment where we're asking questions and the faith building is coming as much from the friends as it is from the other things going on there. You might be a, me, a new you know, mom with young children. You got mom time. You may be you know, for re-engage. You know, if you're married, you know, that's a great class for you. Um, celebrate recovery. As the name says, it's a recovery program, but what's so different about it, it's the environment that makes it so different than other recovery programs, and it makes the success rate as high as it is, higher than any other one as well. I'll tell you, I need faith-building friends in my life. We all do. You may be saying, well, my spouse, that's my faith-building friend. If your spouse is, you're blessed, that's good but it's not enough. And you're putting your spouse into an awkward spot. They can't even be your spouse. You're trying to make them something else. So if you're just interested in going like, you know, maybe I should check it out or find out a little bit more. Here's what you do. Just grab your phone and text 555-888 and then the word group info. One word, group info. We'll get in, you know, we'll get in contact with you to go like, what group or what place might you find faith building friends for your life? Because with them, Reframing helps you to do what you want to do but can't do yourself. Because if you could do it yourself, you already would have, right? Another reframing help we learned from Mary. Now, Mary, she was a sophomore in college. As a sophomore, she texts her parents and says to them, Mom and Dad, I need to talk with you in person. 
all capital letters. So he comes home the next weekend. Mary says, um, you guys may want to sit down. And when they do, she says, um, I've been going out to a bar for the last semester. In fact, I've been drinking more and more. And, and I met a guy, and well, one thing has led to another, and I just want you to know that I'm now pregnant with twins. But here's the good news. He will be off probation in a year now. <laughs> and as soon as he finishes rehab, he said he's going to get a job. You may think, I know some people would say 29 years is a pretty big age gap. But we really, we, we feel like we love each other and we want to raise the babies together. And her mom and dad just sit there. Mary continues, Mom, Dad, you know that I love you. And so I want you to know that everything I told you, none of it is true. The truth is, I got a D in chemistry. And I just wanted you to know that things could have been a lot worse. <laughs> I got high schoolers in college, they, they're taking notes right now, like... I, Sometimes we just need to, to come to this point of going like, you know what, this is true, but it could be worse. It's true. I, my plane broke down. I've just missed my connections. But my plane broke down when it was on the ground and I wasn't up in the air. <laughs> it's true. My kids just smashed up the car and it's going to cost thousands of dollars to repair. We don't have that extra income. But I'm thankful that nobody was hurt with it. It's true. Just lost a big account. That hurts. But we haven't lost our job. We haven't lost our company. And over and over, we need to say, at these times, when this is happening. This is true. But you know what? I'm thanking God for what didn't happen as well. One of the reframing help. I think this is, I hope this is, Super helpful for everybody. And that is to take the time to focus on God's goodness and on his promise. Everybody should have gotten on the way in. If you've got a uh, bulletin on the way in, you've got one of these cards. If you got it, would you grab it real quickly? If you didn't get a bulletin on the way in on the left side of all the pews and chairs, um, you're going to find a stack of these cards. Would you just pass them down the aisle so that everybody can have one of these? When we started this series out, we did so with this intention. I mean, we know that what we're talking about is really important. Be careful how you think. You know, how you think shapes all of your lips. We know that that's important. But we want to go from just being able to learn some important things, people going like, whoa, that's really interesting, to... I am doing something in my life that's actually changing it right now because my life is moving in the direction of my strongest thoughts. And what is a tool that we can put into our hands to help us to actuate our faith? You know, to activate it out there. And this card is one of the means that we um, designed to be able to do just that. The card, on the top we'll put this, my storm says. And we talk about our storms. The storms are the things right now that are robbing you of peace. The storms, the real things in your life, I mean, this is how it would frame up when you would look at it. What is it that's keeping you from joy? What are the mental prisons that you are finding yourself in? Either somebody else has put you in, past circumstances of your life, things that you may be putting yourself in that way. God says, I want you to be able to be free from those mental prisons. Those are the storms that we have, which is contrasted by what God says to us. Now, your storm may be this, the problems. And because of the circumstances you're going through and the things that are outside of your control, and they are bad, you may have deduced that God doesn't care. And when you have problems and you figure that God doesn't care, this is what your mind, this is where your thought, and this is where your life and direction, that's how everything gets framed up, and hence our life goes in that direction. Contrast that with this. When God says, not only do I care, but I've sent my son, Jesus, for you. I have promised you, I am never, ever, ever going to leave you. I'm never going to forsake you. There is a day that I think epitomizes reframing. It's 
called Good Friday. So just before Easter, you get Good Friday. You ever wonder, what is good about Good Friday? Who came up with that name? I can't think of anything, because on Good Friday, you find Jesus suffering and being crucified. In fact, Isaiah would put it this way. On Good Friday, Jesus is being wounded for our transgressions. He's being bruised for our iniquities. The payment of our sin price, our hell, the judgment of God is resting upon him. Good Friday epitomizes the worst that Jesus ever went through and experienced in eternity. What is good about Good Friday? Nothing unless you realize this, that he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, and the payment of our sin was accomplished on him. The Lamb of God came and he took away the sin of the world. Because of the cross and all of the suffering and pain and shame there, it led to the hope and freedom and eternal life for the world. That's that reframing. And having eternal perspective, it can just make all the difference in the world. Now with that card, here's what I want you to, we need to remember and acknowledge this. That what my storm says, it has merit. In fact, you may be framing your thoughts, you may be framing your mind, your life. Your life is heading in a certain direction because of the frame that you've got around this. Because there's truth to it. Your marriage may be in a really bad place right now. You may be going through crippling debt. You may have something in your life that you've tried to change and you've never been able to change it yet. And so what's the hope? If the past is a predictor of the future, here's where you're gonna be stuck forever. It may be that your kids, I mean, they are in a bad place. You see them going in a direction of where they're going. There is merit to this. It's not like you're just making it up or it's an imaginary thing. There's reality to it. This whole, again, like that is a picture of my mind. But if this is where you choose to do your framing and you begin to interpret God via your circumstances, then your life is going to reflect that. And just as this has merit, I want you to realize that this is merit as well. What God says to you, it has substance, there's reality. I mean, you talk about being rooted in the resurrection of Jesus himself. I talked about that eternal perspective. I I chuckle when I I think back on this, but um, John Rice was a preacher. And so uh, John Rice, after service one day, he had somebody come up and threaten his life. Literally, the guy took a gun out, stuck it in John Rice's face and say, what do you think about this? And John Rice just looked at him and said, you think you can scare me with heaven? <laughs> when the worst you can do is move me to heaven, that's a perspective that, again, It shapes my thinking. It shapes my living that way. I'm not sure I would have said what John Rice said at that point, but I want to give credit where credit is due. This card in hand. How many today would just be open enough? I'm not going to ask you what it is, but how many would say there is a storm that is going on in my mind? There is thoughts that are moving me in a direction, not toward peace, but toward worry and toward anxiety. There are things that are going on that are robbing me of joy, that are robbing me of peace. I got storms that are going on in my life. Would you just like raise your card up? I mean, like how many of us are there? Because my card is raised up. I mean, can you show us that? If you're online right now, you can download this card and I want to encourage you to do so. Because with this, Today, you can begin the reframing that you need that's going to bring about the life change that God wants you to have. You're going to change your thinking, and it's going to change your living. If you happen to be with us last week, I've said to renew your mind, there's four things you need to do. And I'm telling this now just to kind of see how these things work together. If you weren't with us last week, you can go online and see that if you'd like to. But the way we renew our mind is we write it, we think it, we say it, and we live it. Write it, think it, say it live it. Those things take place. 21 days, you literally reconstruct what's in your mind. Change 
deeply held, you know, um, uh, storms and traps that are there, you repeat it for three cycles, 63 days, you will completely bring about this life change. Again, neuroscience is the one that just reinforces what it is that God has to say about that. If you'll take this today, and I'm going to give us, um, before we leave today, I want to give us the space to activate our faith. I want us to, we're going to have the time to write out What is the storm that is going on in my head right now? What is it that God says? And you may not even know what God says. And if not, you can just take this default. God says, I sent Jesus. I am with you. That just may be your default until you get something a little bit more specific here. With cards in hand, I want to begin just by praying over you and praying over that which you have in your hands. God, use this is what I'm going to pray to help us to do the reframing in our life that we need to, the reframing that you want for us, and that which is going to move us in the direction of our strongest thinking, our lives that way. Before I do that, maybe today we've talked about Jesus and the gospel, what he did for us, you know, Good Friday again, but you haven't personalized that yet. You're like Paul before he trusted or received Jesus. Kind of going the other way. If you're ready to put your faith in him, to repent and say, Jesus, I need what you did for me on the cross, I'm just going to ask you to pray this prayer with me. Jesus, as best I know how, I want to open my life to you. May I have the forgiveness. May I have the life that you offer to individuals. That's the beginning point. And from there, he'll not only bring you to life, but then life to the full, which brings us right back to where we're at together. So let's pray with cards in hand, blank right now as they may be, and then we'll give space, about 120 seconds today, to do the framing and reframing that this card will hold for us. Thank you, God, not only for truth, but for the action steps to be able to live it out. Because when we leave here and our faith is full and we go out into the world and work and school and our faith gets emptied, that we can be experiencing this hope, this help in our life. For those that are here now, Jesus, and they are ready. They're just ready to open themselves to you, to trust you as Savior. And as they pray this prayer, Jesus says, best I know how. I want to ask you to be my Savior. I want to ask you to be the Lord of my life. Please, I don't deserve it, but by your grace, would you become my Savior now? If that's your prayer, very first time you've just tra- asked or trusted Jesus, can I ask you, would you just raise your hand up and wave at me, indicating that? Yeah, that's good. Others, sometimes it'll take me just a second with these. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. Use this next two minutes to change our lives. We pray in your holy name. And everybody in agreement said? Amen. Amen. For those that have just opened their lives up to Jesus, can we just take a moment to go like, hey, we are so, so happy. I mean, really, I mean, we are so, so happy for you. I encourage you, um, if you would, sometime before you leave, now if you want, grab your phone. Same number, 555-888, but text these words, learn more. I'd love to be able to get this booklet into your hand, you know, a little bit of helps that tell you, like, what do I do next, or how does things, you know, how do things go from there? Now, as I said, and nobody, please, I hope nobody will, you know, you know, squeeze out real quick for these next two minutes. Let's take this, and let's write it out. And I want to encourage you, put a frame around the one that you say, this is where my focus is going to be. This week, pick it up. Just two minutes a day. Look at it. Reframe again if you need to. And watch this renewing of your mind begin to take place. Let's activate our faith right now together and use this to do so.
let's sing together, let faith arise. Please stand.